Good morning, Hickory Knoll. I was uh, asked to, well, actually, I was asked about 25 years ago to participate in the funeral of uh, this lovely lady you see on the screen. Her name is Evelyn Shannon. And uh, Evelyn pre planned everything. As a matter of fact, her, this is her funeral program. She planned it all out the songs and, and it, who was going to participate and all that. And she lived to be almost 107 years old. She was an amazing person. She had vision and she had a heart for evangelism and soul winning that was just amazing. And everyone who knew her knew that about her. One of the stories uh, that were told at her, that was told at her funeral, was um, how that when she was 90 years old, she invested in a project in Namib Namibia. Uh, Africa to buy and put out macadamia trees to produce macadamia nuts and it was going to be done on the property that belonged to some the church and it was a, a property where there was a, a, a school for training preachers and the idea was that uh, after a few years these trees would start producing the macadamia nuts and they could be sold to um, uh, help fund the education of these preacher training students in Africa. She lived to see that happen. As a matter of fact, for the last three years, those trees produced a, a crop of macadamia nuts that were sold and the funds were used to fund the school. And she was, she was just amazing like that. How many of us at age 90, if we're fortunate enough to live that long, would be thinking that far out in the future? She, she did that. She was, oh, she was, I just could talk all day about her. Um, she left her last request, and, and these are all about, the, it's a message to the church, it's, to mes it's a message to people like you and me. Uh, first of all, there's a section called Think on These Things, and, um, and they were things like, the Bible is God's inspired word, and, uh, and God is, and He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, and several other points. Then she had another section about the unity in the church. She said, I want you folks to love one another. Sound like the same thing the Lord said on the night before he was killed. And it's so that he said, uh, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And then the last thing at the bottom of her funeral program, here's what she said. And she said, I, oh, and one other thing she had requested. She said, I want you to get up there and announce my death and then ask the church to say hallelujah. And so the preacher who was doing that uh, he, he said, now this is my job. She told me to do it. And so the whole church, almost like a song service, said, you know, he said, Evelyn Shannon has passed away before he read her obituary. And uh, he said, now when I say so, you say hallelujah. And so the entire church said, hallelujah. And then there was like a, a, a laugh and a smile because that was Evelyn for you. But the last thing she wanted us to know, everyone who thought of her after she was gone, was this. Heaven and hell are real. And we will all spend our eternity in one of them. Now, is that not an evangelistic funeral sermon or what, what would you say? So, I, so with that in mind, uh, and I know that there's been some class discussion recently about uh, life after death. And so I thought we would talk about that for a few minutes this morning. And uh, you know the scripture in Hebrews 9, verse 27, 28, just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting on him. And so the scripture plainly teaches that you and I are supposed to die in this physical body in order to make it over to the other side where we will get that new body that will, um, will be uh, eternal, eternally young, eternally healthy. So what's it like to die? And what's it like once you get over there? Well, the scripture says in Ecclesiastes um, 12, 7, that when we die, then our bodies begin to decay. And as a matter of fact, they go back to the dust from which they came. But our spirit or our soul goes back to God who gave it. In other words, that simply means that our soul is now in the care and keeping of God Almighty who created us. Now, we've already mentioned from Evelyn's funeral sermon that there is, um, there is uh, in eternity, there are two places, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. The scripture also says in Ecclesiastes 9, 5, that the, death, that the dead know nothing. In other words, 
you will hear people say things like um, that they believe that their departed loved one is now an angel well that's impossible angels are different beings from human beings and we will never convert to being an angel and others are believing that uh, their departed loved one is now watching down over them as they play football or as they you know are doing something else and I know you and I, you were blind in, in the when you were you couldn't see because you were blind I know you can see now you can see me you see me playing football all those stories are beautiful but they just don't line up with scripture because the Bible teaches that the dead are well it's like the dead are sleeping uh, it's like it's, uh, imagine well I'll, I'll use myself for an example last night when I went to sleep and until I woke up this morning at 6 when I got my wake-up call, it just seemed to me like no time at all went by. I was asleep, you see. And so when we die, then we go into this state where we are, uh, our situation where we are not, we're, we're not confined to time. And we are, oh, and God is keeping us for, for resurrection day and judgment day. And so there's this amount of time and uh, we're not aware of what's going on on earth. We're not going to be disappointed at who wins or loses an election or something like that because we don't know, because we've passed from this life and now we're over on the other side. And so I thought it would be interesting to... Now, what I'm about to read you, it does not answer every question that you're going to have and we don't have time in a normal funeral, uh, uh, funeral in a normal sermon uh, uh, episode to cover all the questions that you might have but let's read one man's experience and this time I'm talking about the experience of the rich man now we're gonna also see another man and this is Lazarus but right now let's look at this um, this man's experience uh, after death and this is a follow I'm in Luke chapter 16 this is a follow-up to um, what Jesus and the people had been discussing in the earlier part of this scripture, this, this chapter. For instance, back up to verse 8, and I'm breaking into the middle of a story, but uh, I, we don't have time to read it all. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, when wealth is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? True riches have to do with eternal things. Verse 12. And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. Now there's some very important points made there. But now the Lord is going to tell a story, we're skipping down to verse 19, which is a follow-up to what he's just taught. Now, is this a story or a parable? We don't exactly know. Uh, but, but the points are, the, are, the, are valid either way. Whether this is a story uh, that Jesus is telling or it's a parable, which is a, like a physical story that has a spiritual meaning. Either way, Jesus is teaching. This is what he says. I'm just going to read it through without comment first. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, 
And the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, and by the way, this actually should be translated Hades. In Hades, where he was in torment, this is the rich man. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm has been, that's been fixed so that those who want to come from or go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Well, there's so much could be said about this. Let's just go back through it and, and kind of break it down. There was a, uh, a rich man. This means he was popular because, I mean, after all, uh, rich folks tend to, to draw us like magnets. You know what I mean? I, uh, Alan saw me chase down a guy in a hallway recently who is, I'm talking about Mr. Anderson, who is very wealthy. And I just wanted to get a little FaceTime with him and, and to make sure he remembered me. You know what I mean? Because he's helped our school before and I want to encourage him to do it again. And so if you're rich, you're going to be popular. And he was dressed in purple. Purple is the color of royalty and the color that rich folks, not because they were LSU fans, but because uh, it was a very expensive and hard to get dye. And anytime you could afford something that was a, a garment that was dyed purple, then you were in the money. Uh, you, they could call you Mr. or Mrs. Moneybags. And, uh, and, and his fine linen, this means his inner clothing. You might think underwear and things like that. But uh, the underlayer was fine linen. And he lived in luxury every day, which means he ate the best food. Just think about the very best food you can imagine. No matter how expensive it is, whatever you might think, caviar, things like that. And this is what this man ate all the time. Well, at his gate was laid a beggar. Somebody brought this beggar apparently like every morning and he laid there all day long and 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 laid him at the rich man's gate now the bible doesn't say that the rich man mistreated lazarus it doesn't say that when he left his home and went out his gate that he kicked the poor beggar it doesn't say that at all it doesn't say that he cursed at him he didn't say why don't you hang out somewhere else instead of in front of my no he just kind of ignored him you know what i mean he didn't pay attention to this poor person who was not only poor but sick and had these ulcerated sores and with and the dogs and dogs were considered unclean in that day and time in that culture and these dogs came and licked his uh, his sores and this was a man who couldn't you know I, I can think flies and bugs probably were on him too you know so this guy's in bad shape and the rich man is not doing anything about it and he's not showing any concern for him. In that day and time, and it's still that way in many cultures, and I've been in cultures such as in India where people don't use forks or chopsticks, they eat with their hand, always with their right hand. The left hand is considered unclean and you, you only put something in your mouth with your right hand. And I've seen people, and they do it very skillfully. It's amazing how they can just clean a bowl and, uh, of rice and soup and all these things with their, with their fingers. And uh, in this day and time, when the rich man and Lazarus were being considered in this passage, um, they, they always had some bread. Maybe it was day-old bread, but if you're rich, it's probably not even day-old bread. But they had bread, and they would wipe their hands just like uh, I had a meal last Friday. It was, uh, it was barbecued chicken with a lot of barbecue sauce on it. I used five napkins 
five napkins just to clean up after this, this meal was over. Well, the rich man would wipe his hands on the bread and, uh, and like this, and then, uh, and then it would be thrown out. Well, apparently these are the crumbs that, the, that poor Lazarus was trying to get because uh, that bread with that stuff wiped on it from the rich man's hand, uh, which was the gravy and the juice and the sauce and all that, uh, that was, in his opinion, uh, uh, good bread, good eating. And so he was always there to try to get some of that bread uh, that the rich man had wiped his hands on. Verse 22, the time came when the beggar died, and this would be a pauper's funeral, in which probably, you know, there were people who took up a collection. They went around saying, you want, you want to chip in on helping, uh, you know, with this, this poor guy Lazarus' funeral? Um, and, and so the, there was the, but the angels, the angels came and carried him to Abraham's side, which is paradise. That's a, Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom is another way of saying paradise. It's where there's only comfort and joy and happiness. It's a good, good place to be. And the angels took him there. The rich man also died because no matter how much money you got and no matter how much health care you can afford and the very best doctors and the very best medicines it's once appointed unto man to die that's again Hebrews 9 verse 27 and so the rich man can't buy eternal life so he dies and don't you know it was a big funeral but it's not the size of the funeral that matters it's where your soul goes when you die that actually makes the difference and so he was buried and uh, in Hades, verse 23, and Hades is, uh, is not hell, uh, but it is in eternity. You might say it's like the, um, the waiting room or the foyer or the vestibule of eternity. It's the place where souls go until resurrection and judgment day. That's what Hades is. And there are two sides to Hades. There uh, is the paradise side, which is a place of joy and comfort and happiness. And then there's this place called Tartarus, which means, uh, well, in the, the, the effect of it is that it's um, torment. And, and, and this man is thirsty and he's uncomfortable and he's worried and he's concerned and he's experiencing pain and, and heat and he's not happy. And, and uh, he, well, he's just in torment. That ha that's how the Bible sums it up. And so he looks up and he sees someone he recognizes. You say, well, will we know each other in heaven? Um, well, he here's what we always say. We know who we are. This guy knows who he is. And so if I know who I am, and if you know who you are, what's going to keep us from, even if we didn't recognize each other, what would keep us from introducing ourselves to each other? And I'll say to you, hey, I'm Dennis. And you'll say, well, I'm Alan. Oh, yeah. Hick or no? You see, and so we'll, we'll, we, it's a grand reunion. Now, it could be that it'll be just like it is in this story that you look and you see someone and you recognize them. Now remember that Abraham lived a long time before the rich man, but he sees Abraham far away, not close, far away. And he's with Lazarus and Lazarus is by his side. And so he calls to Father Abraham and says, have pity on me. Now that's probably something he's never said before. He's never one time say, would you be willing to help me? He's never, he, he's now using some of the language that poor Lazarus had to use all the time in his life. Have pity on me. Uh, and, and look who's begging now. And, and, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue because I'm in torment in this or agony in this fire. How things have changed. He's now talking new language. He has a, he's had an attitude adjustment. But he still expects Lazarus to serve him, you see, because he's always been served. And uh, it's, it's so he said, would you send Lazarus? Verse 25, but Abraham replied, son, remember. Remember that in your lifetime. Abraham answers kindly, he, but he, he has to say no. He says, uh, there are two reasons why I can't send Lazarus to help you. Number one, it's impossible because of this, uh, this chasm or gulf between us. Number two, it would be improper for one person to cross over from one side to the other. So it's impossible and it's improper because, you see, people, the scripture teaches, are supposed to reap what they sow. And it can't be undone once we get in, in over on the other side. And so the rich man is reaping what he sowed 
And it's not supposed to be fixed after life is over here on earth. It's supposed to stay the same, and it will stay the same. Verse 26, there is a, between us and you is a great gorge, and it's been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. And so he realizes now, the rich man realizes that his situation is forever. It's eternal. He realizes that. And so he starts begging again. Again, this is what Lazarus had to do in earthly life. And now the rich man is begging over on the other side. Verse 27, he answered, then I beg you, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus. He, wants, he still wants to tell Lazarus what to do. And he wants Lazarus to be the servant. Send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let, let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But it's too late. You see, he all of a sudden, he had an evangelistic spirit about him. He, he, he wanted to be a soul winner. He wanted to win the souls of his five brothers so that they would not come to this place. But once this life is over, you can't be a soul winner anymore. I mean, the opportunity is gone forever. The door is closed. And so Abraham replied, verse 29, they have Moses and the prophets. And so what this means by, oh, let me, let me point out why he says they have Moses and the prophets. They are still in the Mosaic age. Jesus has not died on the cross yet. This is before the cross. Therefore, the Christian age has not been introduced or has not begun because Jesus Christ has not died for the sins of the world when this story takes place. And so humanity is supposed to listen to the word of God through the law of Moses, which is the Old Testament. So he says they have Moses and the prophets. And in, in other words, they have God's word, even though it's from the Mosaical age. No, Father Abraham. You see, he doesn't agree with that. He says, I've got a better idea. Why don't you send someone from the dead? They will listen to that. Now, they won't listen to the word because they've heard the word before. They've heard, like people today, hear the gospel and don't do a thing about it. They just let it slide. And they just keep on moving toward death and eternity. And they don't do anything about their soul. You know people like that. I know people like that. There will always be people like that. And so he says, I want to do it another way. I want to do it my way. I want to arrange for Lazarus to come back from the dead and to approach my brothers and tell them, you don't want to go where your brother is. It's agony. It's torment. It's a terrible, terrible place. But verse 31, Moses says this, or Abraham says this, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. And you know that's true. It's true because of human nature. You take the other Lazarus, the one uh, who was Jesus' friend, you know, the brother of Martha and Mary, and remember how that he was in the, the grave um, and in the tomb to the point that his body was beginning to decay when Jesus brought him back to life. And the Bible says after that, in the next chapter uh, from John 11 to John 12, in verses 9 and 10 of John 12, the people didn't, they were not convinced to get their lives right with God because Lazarus had been resurrected. They wanted to kill this resurrected man. And if, when Jesus was re resurrected from the, the dead, People rejected him, and people turned him down, and people are still turning down the resurrected Jesus today. Abraham knew that just seeing someone who had been dead and now had been brought back to life would not change the hearts and minds of most people, including apparently these five brothers of the rich man. And so the scripture says that the power to save is in a message, not in seeing someone who has been dead and is now alive for, you know, temporarily. The power is in a message, and it's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, there are a lot of things that we can point out, and uh, let's just do this very quickly. First of all, he was still alive. In other words, he still had conscious existence, and you and I will be the same when we get over on the other side. He still had memory. In other words, he could remember his family. He knew who Abraham was. He, he, he was aware of Lazarus. He, he had consciousness, and he had memory, and you and I will too. He was faced with the truth. He was faced with the truth that uh, he was doomed forever. And he was faced with the truth that his brothers were coming there too if they didn't obey the word of God. And, and, and so he, he sees that he's in agony and he realizes the truth, but it's too late. You see, some of us want to embrace the truth while we're alive in this world. 
Other people will see the truth one of these days. That's taught in a number of ways, such as in the book of Philippians, where it says the day will come when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. But that's not in this life. That's when we get over on the other side and we go to judgment. And then everyone, no one will deny the Lord anymore. Only it's too late to confess him after life on this earth is over. The way to be saved is to embrace the gospel and believe it and obey it and confess our faith in Jesus Christ while we are alive in this physical form. Now is the time, not later on, because when we get over on the other side, there is no more opportunity. Opportunity is gone and it's gone forever and we will be unable to warn others. We can't send back messages from the grave. Uh, from the dead, from, from Hades. We can't send back a message and, and encourage someone and insist that someone uh, get right with God and get their sins forgiven so that uh, they can avoid that horrible place. If, if, of course, we're in a horrible place. And if we're in heaven or in paradise, then we, we can't say, I want you to come and be with me because the, the opportunity to communicate with those alive on earth is over and it's over forever. And so the scripture teaches that the time to get right with God is not sometime down the road. It's not one of these days when it's convenient for me. It's not when I get everything all sorted out and straightened out and I get my job fixed and I get, my, I get this paid off and I, uh, I, I settle this argument with so and so and I do all these things. The time is now. Luke 16:31. He said this, Abraham said this to the rich man, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. And so the time to be saved is not in the future. The time to be saved is now. So what's the summary? What's the, what, what are some of the takeaway points from what we've read today? Well, number one, riches cannot save us. But I've got news for you. Poverty won't save us either. You know, th there, there is a, a, a mindset in the world that if you are rich, and it was true in this day and time, then you must be a good person and doing a lot of things right. And if you are poor, it must be that you've made such terrible choices and that you're just a bad person. And rich folks are good and bad and, and poor people are bad. That's not true. But it's, it, but it's not true also that rich people are bad and poor people are good. It doesn't matter how much money we have. It matters whether or not we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what matters. It's not, how, it's not what your bank account reflects. But it does matter if we were willing to help people or not. And that's one of the takeaways. Because this scripture is teaching that we are supposed to be concerned and care about other people. I got a text this morning. It was, uh, I've got two texts about the same thing. <clears throat> Pray for Larry and Joyce Kirby. Okay, now let me tell you who Larry and Joyce Kirby are. They're friends of mine, first of all, and they, uh, he is a gospel preacher. He's a graduate of our school, Heritage Christian University. And uh, when, uh, when he was a student with us, uh, they had two children and, and a little boy was born to them, a third child, and the little boy lived to be about six months old and, and died. He was born with some sort of heart problem and, and so he lived six months. That left them with uh, a boy and a girl. Well, years went by and their daughter got married only to be killed at gunshot by her crazy husband. Last night, their last child, their son, had a sudden heart failure and passed away. And now this couple, they've lost all three of their children. Now, <clears throat> I know that there will be a lot of, of outpouring of concern for this couple. This is, a, this is one of the best these people, you say, why do bad things happen to good people? And the answer is, I don't know. Another question is, why do bad things happen to God? Why did bad things happen to Jesus? Why did he have to die in order for our sins to be taken away? So there are a lot of questions we don't exactly know the answer to. But we need to be, I want, I want, I want, to, be, I want to demonstrate concern for, and I want to help this couple, and I will in any way I can. One of the ways I can help them is to ask you to pray for them. Larry and Joyce Kirby. So, because we're supposed to help each other. And we cannot change, here's another takeaway, we cannot change our eternal destiny once we get to the other side. Once our heart stops beating and the brain activity is gone and our spirit leaves our body to go be back with God, there are, you can't change anything about what's happened 
in this life. You can only do it while you're still alive. Another takeaway is the gospel of Christ is God's only power to save through Jesus who is the only Savior. Romans 1 verse 16. And the last takeaway is simply this. The gospel must be believed, embraced, and obeyed before we die. And that's why I keep saying, and that's why Abraham kept saying to the rich man, you had your chance. You let it pass by. You did nothing about it. But you need to know, and your brothers need to know, that the time to be saved is now. And on the screen you see the scriptures that teach God's plan of salvation. You might say the road to heaven or the way to have sins forgiven so we can go to heaven. And the scriptures teaching in 1 Timothy 2, 4 on that vertical sidebar there that God desires that all of us be saved. But in order to be saved, we must hear the gospel of Jesus and believe it, repent, confess our faith in Jesus that we believe he's God's son and our savior. And receive baptism for forgiveness of sin with an attitude that we're going to be faithful. We're going to stick with it. We're going to trust God all the way until the very end. And by doing so, not only are our, are our sins forgiven, but our soul is saved. And we will hear those beautiful words on Resurrection Day. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. And so we want to sing a song of encouragement today to encourage anyone and everyone who has not yet obeyed these commands in order to have sins forgiven and be prepared for death and eternity. We want to give you this opportunity today to let us know that you want, as a believer, willing to repent, that you want to confess and be baptized in order to have your sins taken away and be prepared for eternity. If you need to come... We want to encourage you to come while we're singing this song or let us know after the service is over. A lot of people do that. If you've already obeyed these commands, but you are carrying burdens that are wearing you down because of trouble in your life, you'll never find a better time than right now to ask your church family to pray with you and for you. If you need to come to the Lord, now is the time. Won't you come while together we stand and sing?